Good morning. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're interacting with God on a regular basis and not just when we're together here or when you're with your small groups, but every day because God is interacting with us every day. We are loved by a God and a Savior who knows us and loves us still, is good to us every day, and loves us without condition. He is so good, and we are his grateful people. So I encourage you now to let anything go that's getting in the way of your ability to interact with that Savior. We're going to start this morning with prayer and song. Would you do that with us now? Let him in. Let's do that together. God, would your Holy Spirit please fill us this morning? We want to receive the Spirit. We want to receive the truth of who you are and the truth of who we are in your eyes. God, bless this time today together. May the name of Jesus be exalted above all names, freshly on our lips, ready to sing his praise. And in his name we pray. Amen. I hear the Savior say, your strength indeed is small. Child, the weakness watch and pray, find in me your all and all. Jesus paid it. Have been faithful. 
So we'll be closing out our Love One Another series this week with one of the greatest commandments to actually love one another. So here's John 15, 9 through 17. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. This is the word of the Lord. Well, this morning we are wrapping up our summer series on the one another's. And before we get to this amazing passage, I just want to remind you again of why we chose to do this. And let's just say this has been a really strange summer for all of us. And as we as elders thought and prayed about what would be the most important thing that we could talk about as, as a group of people, we thought this was it, the one another's. You know, as, as COVID hit and, and our usual forms of gatherings were suspended, that caused us to ask certain questions like, what is the church? Like at its essence, what is it? What is it when we can't gather in some of the ways we're used to? And our answer to that is at its essence, the church is one another. It is the people of God, the, the people that God has chosen in this world to be the body of Christ together in this world. And as we look at the division in our nation as well, and, and the, the ugly dialogue that's happening and the egos and the criticism and the the self-righteousness and the judgmentalism and all of that, we are asking the question, what does it mean to be the church in the world? What does it mean to, to have a distinctive flavor in this world, in this moment? And our answer to that was these one another's, right? Don't judge one another, serve one another, bear with one another, spur one another on, pray for one another. So I just want to remind you, that's why we've been walking through these all summer. And for our final week, we get to the most famous one another of all by the master himself, Jesus, this wonderful one another that we get in verse 12, love one another. And really, this one another lies underneath all the other one another. So you, you could say all the other ones are just specific examples of what it means to truly love one another. And so I want to just start by 
sharing some things that we already know about love, which is this, that when Jesus invites us into this word love, he's using the Greek word agape. And agape is much more than an emotion or, or a sentiment or a feeling. It is about action and commitment for one another's goods. It's a, it's a sacrificial form of love. And you see him define this love in a couple ways in this passage. First in verse 12, love each other as I have loved you. And these 12 men gather around this table. This is the Last Supper. They had just experienced three years of Jesus loving them really well, pouring out his life to them, teaching them, training, praying for them, doing so much, just giving his life in love to them. And he's saying, that's the kind of love now I'm asking for you to have for one another. And then, of course, in verse 13, he goes on to say this, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And of course, that's what Jesus was going to do the next day. And so this is the kind of love we're talking about. It's, it's a Jesus kind of love. It's a sacrificial kind of love. It's the kind of love where we, we lay our lives down daily for one another. We act on behalf of each other's good, even when it's hard. And this is a kind of love that's really hard. It's really easy to talk about in front of a screen, but it is hard. It is, it is sacrifice to love this kind of way, to live in this kind of love. And so that's the kind of love Jesus is talking about. But what I'd like to focus uh, my thoughts today, uh, my comments today, are on some of the connections Jesus makes in this passage between love and other things. And, I, and I've, as I studied this this week, I just found these really interesting connections that he makes that I hadn't fully seen before. So there's three connections I want to talk about uh, this morning. The first is the connection between love and obedience. And then second, the connection between love and joy. And then third, the connection between love and bearing lasting fruit in this world. So first, this connection between love and obedience that Jesus makes. Let me read verse 9 again. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remained in his love. Then verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. So I want to put an image up on the screen that shows this relationship that Jesus makes between love and obedience. He's basically saying the way you remain in my love is you obey my commands. And here's my fundamental command. It is to love one another. That's how you remain in my love. And, and he articulates it in this passage first in terms of his relationship with his father. He says, I remain in my father's love by obeying him. And the way I, I obey him is I love you guys the way the father loves me. And then he says, that's how it should be with you and me, that you remain in my love as you obey my commands. And the way you obey my commands is you love one another the way I love you. So all that being said, there's this intimate connection between love and obedience. And the reason, of course, is because God's primary commandment that we're to obey is the commandment to love, to love him and to love one another. Paul in his letters puts it this way, all of the commandments can be summed up in this single word, love your neighbor as yourself. And so there's this close connection between love and obedience that I just want to mention today. But I say that because I wonder how often we live in that intimate connection. And here's what I mean. Like if you and I were having a conversation, and I probably would never ask this question, but if I just asked you the question, have you been obedient to God lately? And you just heard me phrase it that way. Have I been obedient to God? I wonder like what your thinking would be in order to answer that question. And I'll just tell you for myself, I would probably go along the lines of, I think about certain temptations that I struggle with. And I would see, have I, have I been faithful to avoid those temptations lately? Or I might think of certain spiritual disciplines that I'm, I'm supposed to pursue in my relationship with God. And I would see how, how well have I been doing that? Or I might just think generally in terms of purity. Like, have I kept myself clean? Have I kept myself pure from some of the things in this world? But based on this, this passage, Jesus invites us into a simple question. To answer the question, have I been obedient? What I simply have to do is ask this question. Have I loved well lately or not? Because that is the primary form of obedience that Jesus invites us into, requires of us. That's his, his ultimate word on obedience is, is love, love, love. Have you loved well? 
And you can have all sorts of things in place in your life. And if you do not have love, you are missing the whole point. And the scriptures say that over and over again. All that to say, Jesus is calling us to this intimate connection between love and obedience, which then is how we remain in the Father's love. All right, so that's the first connection, love and obedience. Uh, The second, this is probably my favorite one, is the connection between love and joy. And you see it in verse 11. Jesus says this, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now he says, I have told you this, and the this is what he was just talking about in terms of love and obedience, living this life of love. So he's saying, I'm telling you to live this kind of life where you remain in my love by obeying me, by loving one another. I'm telling you to live that way Because I want you to experience joy in this life. And living that way is how you experience joy. Here's how he puts it. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you. And I want you to just think about that for a second. My joy, Jesus, will be in you. Each of us has to ask ourselves if that sounds like a very attractive thing to us or not. For Jesus' joy to be in us. And to answer that question, we have to ask ourselves, do we think Jesus is a very joyful person or not? And I would suspect that some of us, when we think of Jesus, we actually don't think of him as this extremely joyful person. But I want to suggest today that it is a simple fact of history that Jesus was in fact a very joyful and joy-filled person. And you just think, he's telling this to his disciples after three years, my joy can be in, in you. You wouldn't say that to people unless you know that they have experienced you as a very joyful person, right? It's not like the disciples hear him say that and are like, actually, you're really cranky. I, I, I don't want your joy. That, that's not very attractive. It would be something that they would really want. And when, as you just watch his public ministry, an undeniable fact is he was such a compelling and magnetic personality, right? People were so attracted to him, especially broken people were attracted to him. And you have to ask why. And I think at, li- at least one of the answers is because he was a very joyful person. He just exuded joy. And that joy was was compelling to people. He had this indestructible joy, even through really challenging circumstances in his life. And so he's saying, my joy can be in you. But here, my main point is to say this. He's connecting joy with love, right? Love the way I love, and my joy will be in you. And your joy, he says here, will overflow. So he's saying, pour yourself out in love, serve, give yourself to others. This is the way to experience true joy in life. My joy, overflowing joy. You will find joy in this life as you learn to love. And again, just as with love and obedience, I wonder how how often we make that connection between love and joy. And I think a lot of people don't. I think if we just look at the way people live their lives, the way they pursue joy, they're not making a connection between loving people and finding joy in life. I think so many people, and many of us even, um, when we think about, I want to have joy in my life, what what we do is we just think, um, if I pursue my own desires, right, I'm going to come up with some happiness, happiness agenda that I've determined will work for me. And if I can get those things, these pleasures, whatever, then I'm going to find joy in life. And people do that in different ways. Some people, they think, if I can pursue success in my work, or if I can make a name for myself, that's what's going to lead to joy. Or if I, can, if I can be wealthy, if I can live a certain lifestyle, if I can have certain comforts and pleasures, that, that's what's going to lead to joy. And some of those things are fun and do bring pleasure. But true joy, Jesus' joy, overflowing joy, actually doesn't come from those things. And Jesus says, My joy, true joy, comes actually from a life of love. It comes from constantly pouring yourself out for others, loving, serving them, giving yourself to them. That is actually what leads to a life of true joy. And so in calling us to love, while Jesus may be calling us towards something that's sacrificial, he's actually also inviting us into a life where true joy can be found. And so we need to recognize that connection. All right, so love and obedience, love and joy. And then finally, 
this connection between love and bearing lasting fruit. And for that, we have to go to verse 16, where Jesus says this, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And by fruit, that image, I think what Jesus has in mind here is this spiritual impact that these guys would have on the world, right? These are the 12 apostles. And he's saying, I chose you to go out and bear fruit, right? He's going to build his church. They're they're going to be the witnesses. They're going to spread the word. So that's the fruitfulness. There's going to be a harvest, to use that metaphor, of people coming to faith in God. So they're going to make this big spiritual impact. Uh, That's the fruitfulness that he has in mind for them. But then in verse 17, He goes right back to this command to love. This is my command. Love each other. Love one another. So the promise of fruit is paired very closely with this command to love one another. And I think here's the connection. It is their love for one another that will actually be one of the primary witnesses to the watching world. That is one of the ways they will bear fruit in the world. And Jesus makes that connection so clear throughout John. In chapter 13, he says it this way, As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And then he says this, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. It's your love for one another that will demonstrate to people, that will be the the telltale sign that you are my disciples. In chapter 17, he says something very similar. He doesn't use the word love, but he uses the word unity. He's praying here and he says this, Father, I pray that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me. May they be brought to complete unity, and here it is, to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. It is their love for one another, Jesus is saying. It is their unity together that will be a huge part of their impact on the world. It is what will bear lasting fruit, that the, the world will look at Their relationships, the disciples' relationships with each other, say, look at how they love. Look at how they forgive. Look at how they bear with one another. Look at how they serve one another. And they'll conclude, maybe this Jesus, there's, there's something about him, right? Maybe God is in their midst. And so again, I think this is a surprising connection, this connection between loving one another and our witness in the world. And I, I think, again, so often when we think about making an impact in the world, being a witness in the world, we, we have such an individualistic lens and we just think about my impact in the world, right? And we think about conversations that I want to have with my neighbors or coworkers and that just being able to say just the right thing or ask just the right question. And of course, that's a huge part of what it means to be a witness in the world. But here Jesus is reminding us of the bigger picture. He's reminding us your spiritual fruit is, is really, in the end, not just about what you do as individuals. It's actually... It's all about your community. It's about how you are with one another. It is your love for one another that will make some of the greatest impact in the world. And so I think that idea is actually a perfect place to end not only this message, but this entire summer. That it is the way that we love one another that can make a lasting impact, that can be a witness to the watching world that in fact, God did send his son Jesus to die for us. And that in fact, God does love us through his son, Jesus. As I said at the the outset, um, these are strange times. And the world around us is anxious. It is hemorrhaging. It is struggling and ego and bitterness and anger and self-centeredness win the day so often. And so the question for us as God's people in this time is this, what will our witness be in this moment? What will our lasting fruit be in times such as these? And Jesus says this, love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Well, in reflecting on our teaching today, I'd like us to focus in on David's second point, the connection between love and joy. And I think this is an intriguing pairing and honestly something that I think we may have the tendency to miss. It almost feels counterintuitive, right? I think we sometimes can feel that when we love others, there's this sort of emptying out of us. We're giving 
away something that as a result can feel like a net loss. And when we think of getting back something, replenishing our souls, we often turn to self-centered means or earthly means to try to do that. But joy is transcendent. And I like this definition of joy. Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the word, in the world, and in the way we love. You see, joy is not something we can manufacture on our own. It's a gift of the Spirit. And so as we love others, God moves and produces a supernatural feeling in our innermost being, a sense of well-being that transcends the dictates of our circumstances. And for me, the place that I have seen this flesh out most obviously in my life is in my relationship with my wife, Tracy. When I love her well, Not only does she respond well in return, which of course benefits me, but there's also a deeper sense of well-being that comes with that, a feeling that the Spirit of God produces in me that benefits me too. Sounds funny to say it, but it feels good to feel good. When I find joy in loving my wife, well, she doesn't say, you're being selfish. Why? Because if I pursue my satisfaction in loving my wife, she is honored. So it is when we love others, and above all, when we love God. So let's just take a moment now to reflect on your experience of joy over this summer. Reflect on when you have poured yourself out for others in love, and look for the connection between joy and love. And then let's pray that the Spirit would give us a vision for joy-filled love for others that would serve as divine fuel in our being loving individuals. Let's take a moment. Father, one thing that is true about all of us is we want to feel good. We want to experience deep satisfaction. We want to experience a state of well-being. But Lord, as you know all too well, we so often go after the wrong things to get that feeling. And they turn out to be fool's gold. So Father, I ask that you move us towards love. May we be drawn more and more towards loving others, not motivated by sheer duty or obligation or moralism, but motivated by the fuel of joy, a joy that can only come from you. So fill us with your spirit, Father. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Praise Him, you heavens and all that's above. Praise Him, you angels and heavenly hosts. Let the whole earth praise Him. Praise Him, the sun, moon, and bright shining stars. Praise Him, you heavens and waters and skies. Let
sun, moon, and stars. Praise in the sun, moon, and bright shining stars. Praise in the heavens and waters and skies. Well, we hope you found this to be an encouragement to you today, and we invite you to engage the discussion questions that we've provided for you uh, immediately following this. And let us leave you with this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.